the sexual practices of European colonists, Native Americans, and African American slaves of the American colonies and early republic reflected economic and religious disparities, providing specific cultural phenomena in which power relations are established and reaffirmed. These hierarchies not only prescribed the role of sex in quotidian American life, they created lasting traditions in sexual practices that continue to the present day. For this thesis, I rely on contemporary and classic historiography, religious studies, and gender scholarship to make claims about the role of women in colonial society and the treatment and fantasy construction of marginalized peoples, namely, African American slaves and Native Americans. Specifically, I will show how colonial women leveraged their scarcity and sexual desirability to secure their gender's procreative role and social utility in Puritan and Southern colonies. I will show how the formation and subjugation of the black slave class acquired distinct and lasting sexual fault lines, how political pressures and economic incentives to justify and nurture slavery shaped white sexual attitudes and behavior, and finally how national myths of manifest destiny and the fecundity of the land came dominate White's experience of Native American sexuality. Bundling It involved a young man and a young woman of marrying age spending the night together in the same bed. But because the Puritans were involved, it was more complicated than that. New England winters were every bit as ferocious then as they are now. Furniture was expensive, and bed space was limited. Ever heard the old saying, politics makes for strange bedfellows? Bedfellows resulted from two people, sometimes complete strangers, sharing the same bed out of necessity. There was no dating as we know it today in colonial America. So, there was very limited opportunity for prospective romantic partners to become acquainted with each other. Sometimes, it was as simple and direct as a man going to a woman's father and saying, Mr. Smith, I'd like to marry your daughter. Is that okay with you? Even if she were agreeable, she could not wed without dad's consent. Bundling allowed young couples to take a test drive, of sorts. The custom was brought over from England and it was especially common among poorer people and those living in rural areas. Here's how it worked. The man proclaimed his interest to the girl's parents. If he was suitable, it was then her decision whether she wanted to spend the night with him in bed. It's important to understand the woman had the final say in this. If she gave the green light, the couple chatted until bedtime. Then they stripped down to their undergarments and crawled in the sack. The dad placed a large bundling board down the middle of the bed. It was a kind of Berlin wall marking his side and hers, with the explicit understanding that there was to be no physical activity of any kind between them. The experience was intended to promote emotional, not physical, intimacy. The couple was expected to talk freely the entire night in a type of extended get-acquainted session. If they clicked, there was a strong expectation that the man would formally propose the next day. To make sure everything stayed on the up and up, the girl's parents often slept in the same room. Some moms and dads even placed their daughter inside a bundling bag with some varieties extending to the neck, just to be safe. However, that was an exception to the practice. But as you can imagine, Things often didn't turn out as virtuously as planned. Reverend Andrew Burnaby wrote contemptuously in 1775, a very extraordinary method of courtship is sometimes practiced among the lower people in Massachusetts Bay Colony, if they do not agree they part, and possibly never see each other again, unless, which is an accident that seldom happens, the forsaken fair one proves pregnant, and then the man is obliged to marry her, under pain of excommunication. The forsaken fair one may have seldom got pregnant as a result of bundling, but a respectable number of accepted fair ones did. Meaning some colonial American women walked down the aisle carrying a bundle other than flowers. In England, 
Indentured servitude is a tale as old as time. In reality, indentured servitude in England, the forefather of indentured servitude in the United States, has a long history that goes all the way back to the days of medieval serfdom, when the lower, working classes functioned as bounded tenant farmers on the lands of the landed elite. Legislatively, the practice also has a robust history in that country. In 1349, for example, an ordinance known as the Ordinance of Laborers declared that any man or woman under the age of 60 who wasn't a tradesperson with a particular craft was required to serve someone with their labor. The law, which was updated in both 1495 and 1563, essentially attempted to reduce the number of the unemployed and those living in poverty by forcing them into a livelihood. In addition, the law was still in effect when Jamestown was founded, and it would play a role in indentured servitude in the New World, as well. Indentured servitude made its way to colonial America in the early 1600s. Why? Because, at the time, the colonies didn't have the infrastructure they would eventually have in the 1700s, and they needed to build it. The Virginia Company of London finished construction of Jamestown in 1607, and they really needed people to help get the town, and much of the surrounding area, on its feet. The way to do that was cheap labor, shipping people over who couldn't afford to ship themselves, thus indentured servants came into play. Boat travel during the early days of the colonies was neither cheap nor safe. Many people died during the passage over the Atlantic, and those that survived found themselves with hefty travel bills to pay back. For the wealthy, travel wasn't exactly a problem. But, for those who did incur a debt, the Virginia Company set up a system of indentured servitude that enabled them to pay back whatever they owed by working it off. This travel for labor exchange system ended up becoming the foundation of the New World's economy. For a time, the system was more popular than slavery. Slaves certainly existed in the early days of the colonies, but they actually weren't as widely used as indentured servants, for a time, that is. The reason for this was that the servants came with a great deal of benefits. For each servant a master sponsored to cross the Atlantic, they were given 50 acres of land by the British government since taking on indentured servants from the homeland helped deal with the overpopulation and poverty problems there. Those benefits greatly exceeded the cost of feeding a servant and paying their way across the sea, so plantation owners embraced the system as a way to substantially increase their land holdings. Not only did they get more land, but they also got someone to work on it for them. When an indentured servant had their fare across the Atlantic paid, they signed a contract that led to them working for their benefactor as a servant for a certain number of years. That number would be anything from four to seven years, with an average of five years. During that time, the servant was seen as their master's personal property through the contract. That contract could be inherited should the owner die, and it could also be sold between masters. The price would be determined by the skills the servant possessed. Servants were given food, clothing, and shelter during their stay with their masters. Some particularly generous masters even gave them a salary during their time working. Assuming they survived, the servant was also paid something called freedom dues or a freedom package. These usually included stuff like land, corn, new clothing, and tools, giving them the basics they would need to make a modest living. They were also allowed to leave the plantation for good. Servants still had some freedom. Indentured servants were not treated as badly as slaves. While they were technically considered property and worked hard, they still had some freedom. As long as they fulfilled their work obligations, they were allowed to leave the plantation with their master's permission. Unfortunately, they were not allowed to get married or have children. Anyone who did face severe punishment. Working on a plantation was difficult work. Many indentured servants were overworked, and, when they were even remotely insubordinate, they were beaten. This violence, along with disease, led to a high mortality rate among indentured servants.
Some masters also sexually assaulted their female servants or beat them to death. In fact, there were instances where some servants organized protests for the way they were treated, only to be hanged in response. When the first black Africans were forcefully brought to Virginia in 1619, they weren't treated as slaves per se, as there were no slave laws in place. Therefore, they were made indentured servants and were more or less given the same opportunities as their white counterparts. Unfortunately, over the next few decades slave laws were passed in the colonies and black folks saw their freedoms taken away. Indentured servitude became an exclusive opportunity for white people before the practice disappeared altogether. It's no secret that, regardless of their relative rights, many indentured servants were severely mistreated. Sometimes, that mistreatment was harsh enough for them to go on the run. Since most indentured servants were white and could speak English, they were very difficult to find and capture as they headed north, as they could easily assimilate into a local population. If they were captured, however, more years were put onto their contract as punishment, along with any physical punishments their master deemed necessary. At the end of the 1600s, the economic model shifted among plantation owners. By the passage of an act concerning servants and slaves in 1705, slavery had become firmly ensconced in colonial society. What happened? Some historians cite Bacon's rebellion, which brought together white and black indentured servants against their masters, as one of the catalyst moments in the transition to the widespread adoption of slavery. The thinking behind this was that slavery, which specifically targeted black Africans for lifetime servitude, would create a racial wedge between workers, making future rebellions unlikely. In addition to quelling rebellions, the number of English laborers coming to the New World had dropped significantly by the end of the 17th century, and landowners Tilda needed Tilda a more stable, continuous flow of laborers. The legally codified lack of rights and freedoms given to African slaves also contributed to the support for this transition. Thanks for watching. Do like, subscribe, and comment.